Hi everybody, we also wish you a warm welcome. Today we have the honor to introduce you to Dr. Engineer Esther Bloom. She's an Associate Professor of Sand Gravel Flow Morphodynamics. We also want to thank Esther Bloom's assistants, Ralph Schielen, Mario Branca and Victor Chavarias for feeding us with information for this presentation. Mrs. Bloom is Dutch and lives in a cute little town um, called Arnhem in the Netherlands. She grew up in Friesland in the northern part of the Netherlands, loved surfing, enjoyed winter, win winter activities twice a year and did many outdoor things. For her, the sky is the limit. She did high school in Friesland and after that she went to the Technical University in Delft, the Netherlands. There she studied civil engineering and got a PhD from the University of Twente. She loves outdoor activities, especially mountain biking and trekking in the mountains. She loves the Pyrenees and the Alps. She prefers to hike in, with a tent, but lightweight, rather than staying in huts or cabins. Also, Norway and Sweden are very popular destinations for, the, for holidays. Her star sign is Leo. Characteristics of a Leo are, for example, self-confident, energetic, purposeful, enthusiastic, and full of life energy. You may ask yourself why Barack Obama is on the slide right behind me. Well, fun fact, they are born on the same day, the 4th of August. <laughs> and here you can see a picture of a family. She is gifted by two wonderful daughters. Her three most important things on the private side in life are her children, being outside, and her partner. And the most important values for her are honesty, equality, and joy. She is a sensitive person who likes to be outdoors and who loves science. She's an excellent teacher and also an inspiring supervisor. Important values in the supervision are for her ambition, be her own project leader, and show initiative. She is professor at the Delft University of Technology and leads the River Engineering Group, which focuses on predicting the short-term and long-term response of the river system to natural and anthropogenic changes. Dr. Engineer Astrid Bloom investigates changes in the riverbed caused by the interaction of the current and the sand gravel mixture on the bottom. We wish you all a good time at this symposium and are now looking forward to Dr. Engineer Esther Bloom. Patrick, welcome. <laughs> Close. 
Um, this will give me a few seconds. Uh, I want to thank uh, Silke for uh, inviting me to talk. Um, I feel honored uh, to be uh, rated amongst powerful women in science. Um, it's a big honor. Um, thank you very much. Um, well, my talk uh, will be uh, about the response of river channel geometry uh, to measures and natural change. And this uh, first slide is one of my favorite pictures. And it shows exactly uh, the three passions that were just described. Uh, rivers uh, being outdoors, um, preferably either on a bike or on foot, uh, high altitudes. Uh, and the last passion is my daughter, uh, daughters. Uh, and one of them is here. You see a little hand. <laughs> it's one of the girls on a free common bike. Um, and this is a picture uh, taken in Norway. One of my favorite areas, besides Pyrenees and the Alps. Um, but I've also cycled in Africa and Mexico and other places. Um, well, let me give a short um, summary of, um, I hope it's, it's visible, um, uh, of what I have done so far. I did an MSc, a Master in Civil Engineering at Delft University um, of Technology. Uh, then I did a PhD at uh, Twente University, uh, so I graduated in uh, river engineering, then I did a PhD in uh, sediment sorting and morphodynamics. After that, I became a consultant um, at uh, what was then called Delft Hydraulics, by now it's called Del Um Then I became a postdoc at Twente University, it's very close to the German border, in the east of the Netherlands. Uh, and I got back to Delft, so I kind of swapped between Trent and Delft. Um, is it scored? Yes. Um, then I uh, stepped down from being a, an academic. Um, I didn't realize at the time that I was ill. Uh, I had Lyme disease. Um, and I managed, uh, actually for, for a long time, not just this period, and I managed to recover, uh, and I should say this is one of my bigger achievements, uh, actually bigger than uh, my achievement in science. It was a big struggle. It was Lyme disease, and um, some of you may know how big the struggle can be if you're dealing with that. Um, then I got back into academia, um, so people were still confident in uh, me, as a person and as an academic, and I got uh, reappointed at Delft University. Um, I got a, a sponsor grant, which is a grant specifically aimed at, uh, at women. Um, and uh, one of the nice things about this grant was that the Dutch Science Foundation um, uh, only offered me and the university the grant under the condition that the university would hire me as an associate professor. Um, and uh, then the rector of the university said, well, okay, we'll do that. <laughs> um, and then I got hired as an associate professor. It was a little bit early for me, but um, it was a help. Uh, it helped me. Um, after that, I got some more grants that enabled me to hire PhD students and postdoc uh, researchers. And uh, together with them, I've worked on mainly uh, river uh, channel geometry and the results that I'm going to share with you today. So I'm going to talk uh, about river channel geometry. Um, why is this important? Um, it's important because we need to understand how a river channel responds to measures and natural change. Uh, we need to respond, uh, we need to understand how it responds in the long term, also because uh, the response on the long term will help us understand what happens in between. So it helps us to understand the transient river response to measures and natural change. It also helps us to understand and interpret deposits of ancient streams. And it helps us in working with rivers rather than working on them. So this is, could be the first statement about nature-based solutions, dealing with nature. So it was already already mapping that um, made the 
your suggestion on the woman's nature. And um, um, my work on this topic has, uh, I've um, published it in three, uh, three recent papers um, and um, regarding academic output, output the, those are the nicest publications um, and the ones that I've enjoyed, enjoyed most working on. So I will talk about those, uh, those results today. Uh, I have four topics. Uh, the first one is a general topic on how river responds, rivers respond to, uh, to change, um, <coughs> about the equilibrium state, the second topic, um, the equilibrium state of a river profile and a variable flow, and the final one is quasi equilibrium state. So it's close to an equilibrium state, but not quite. But I will explain a bit later on. Now, how does a river respond to natural change and measures? Um, there's three ways a river does. Um, first, by adjusting its slope. The second type of change is by changing its channel, uh, its channel width. And the third change, I forget, I can use the pointer, um, is by changing its surface texture. The grain has the solution of the bed surface. So it can change its slope by channel tilting, and um, it usually does so, um, it tilts around the downstream end, right? Because the downstream end is set by base level, sea level, or another base, base level control. Uh, but it can also change its sinuosity. Uh, and by changing its sinuosity, it can change its length, it can become longer and, uh, uh, and shorter, and so it can change its slope. Um, it can change its channel width by uh, a difference between the inner band accretion rate and outer band erosion rate. And it can change its surface texture by fining and coarsening its surface. Now, it's important to realize that the two middle types of change, because, so sinuosity change and the net change of channel width are both related to, to river plan form. And the types of, of rivers that we deal with, especially in countries like Germany and the Netherlands, are engineered rivers, uh, where plant form is fixed. <laughs> so the tip, those, those types of rivers I call um, engineered rivers. And our engineered rivers, they cannot respond through changing its plant form, their plant form. So they can only change uh, through channel tilting, so changing its slope around the downstream end. So it's Enlarging its slope, it's creating aggradation, right? The level increases, um, for instance, and it can change, the river can change its that surface section. Now, here I show an example of um, what I mean with an engineered river. Uh, here you see three uh, images of the Oberrhein, um, this downstream from Basel. Uh, one image is 18, from 1828, the other one 1872. In 1963, and you can see how the stretch has been straightened and narrowed. Um, and if you look more closely, you can see that we've also constructed groins, uh, so completely fixed uh, channel platform. So those rivers, they tend to change and respond to changes in the controls to, to, uh, to, by changing its slope and um, the bed surface structure only. All right, now let's zoom in uh, a bit uh, on the Dutch case, uh, the Dutch part of the Rhine. On the left you see the Rhine Basin, uh, the Netherlands uh, forming the delta of the Rhine and the Mu system. Um, and here you see a zoom. And on the next slide, we'll zoom in two locations uh, close to the, the figure one over here. Uh, and here you see uh, on the vertical axis, you see bed elevation relative to NFP, a reference level, uh, and on the horizontal axis, you see time, years. So it's uh, showing bed elevation change since about 1930s up to 2019. Uh, and you can see a steady decrease of bed level. So the Dutch Rhine is degrading, right? Um, if you look at the situation a little bit closer to the, to the bifurcation point mountain, uh, I can go back to the previous slide to indicate where is Parnen. So Parnen is that bifurcation over here close to Lobit, 
Lobit is where the Rhine enters the Netherlands, and right downstream of Lobit, 10 kilometers downstream of Lobit, um, there you find the verification for the Palladium. Now, that second plot shows how that elevation has changed over the same period um, at, this, at the, that position, just downstream from Parliament. So the system is degrading. Um, now, if we look at the long profile, um, and we plot a few lines, and we show better, uh, again, that elevation uh, relative to NAP on the vertical axis, and now there's river kilometer on the, on the horizontal axis, um, and it's a, a stretch of about 100 kilometers, um, and you can look at the 1950 profile, this is where it starts with, and then 2010 you can see there's a steady decrease of that level. The system is degrading. Um, now, if you look in a, in, a, in a rough manner at the 1950 profile, it's more or less like this, um, the green line over here, and if you look at the 2010 profile, you can see, well, there's indeed um, that level decrease, but it's not just that level decrease, it's a slope decrease. Right? So it's working towards a new equilibrium slope that is smaller than the previous one. So this clearly is a transient state, right? The river is adjusting towards a new equilibrium state, where the new equilibrium state has a smaller slope than the previous one. So it's slope adjustment, and the slope adjustment creates degradation. So the decrease of the equilibrium slope is resulting in degradation because of that tilting around the downstream end. All right, now before we go back to that Dutch case and the origin of the cause of that degradation, um, I want to make some remarks about um, the concept of equilibrium and, and, uh, and transient response. Um, it's important to understand a few things about equilibrium. It's also sometimes called uh, the concept of grade. So this was first introduced by uh, Gilbert and Mackin. A uh, river at grade is a river in its equilibrium state. And a river finds itself in an equilibrium state when it's able to transport the sediment that is supplied from upstream towards the downstream end, right? Because if it's able to transport the sediment that is supplied from upstream, there's no reason for the river to upgrade or degrade. And if the river is not able to transport sediment that is supplied from upstream, the river will either upgrade so that it steepens, right? And then it makes a steeper slope in order for it to transport the sediment downstream. So if it's not in an equilibrium state, it will work itself toward its equilibrium state. So it will always approach its equilibrium state. The equilibrium state itself can change with time, but the river will continue to work itself toward maybe a new equilibrium state, but it will always work itself towards an equilibrium state. Now the controls of this equilibrium state are the filtration curve, um, this means the statistics of the water discharge, so the range of discharges, and the probability of occurrence of each of those discharges. So it's like the probability density function of, of discharges. Um, the gravel and sand flux, or, or portion and gravel, um, but anything that is not washed out, um, and the downstream base level, the downstream water level control. So those are the controls. Um, and typically these controls, they vary with time, and if they vary around stable values, the river is able to approach uh, a dynamic equilibrium state. Uh, and the, for this reason, equilibrium also needs to be considered over a period of years or decades, because of the natural fluctuation of the parameters. Now the relevance of, of the equilibrium state has been uh, discussed quite a bit. Because lots of people have said, uh, have argued, um, well, um, how can the river ever be in an equilibrium state? Uh, the controls are changing all the time, so the river is changing its equilibrium state all the time, so how relevant is it? Um, I would argue that it is likely that the river, or uh, many beaches, find themselves in a quasi equilibrium state. So the controls may slowly change but the river can 
follow that change slowly. Um, and if the controls change slowly, still varying around some, some mean level, um, the river can, can follow that with a response at the same time scale. Um, so if the response if the response of the river is fast compared to the rate of change of the controls, uh, the river is likely to be in a quasi-equilibrium state. And in such a quasi-equilibrium state, the equilibrium relations that we will be deriving in a bit, those will also be valid in a quasi-equilibrium state. All right. Um, now, the initial response, there's three types of response. Initial response, the equilibrium response, or, or long-term response, and everything in between is called the transient response. The initial response is, by definition, the state after a certain imposed change, let's say the constructor dam, um, where only the flow is able to adjust, by definition. And the balance has no time yet to adjust. There's no slow change yet. The flow does adjust fast, and the bed will start to adjust. So aggregation and degradation patterns will form. But the slope has had no time to adjust yet. The long-term response is a new equilibrium state, where the river is able to transport the sediment that is supplied from upstream under the prevailing discharge conditions. And the transient response is everything in between. Um, now, what is important to understand about the transient response um, is that it doesn't determine, the transient response doesn't determine the new equilibrium state. It's the controls of the equilibrium state that determine the equilibrium state. So it's the flow duration curve, ground sand fluxes, and base level. But not what happens in the, in the transient state. You can compute the new equilibrium state without dealing with the transient state, if you know what the controls are. Um, now, if there's a change in an upstream control, um, for instance, a change in the flow duration curve, because of climate change, for instance, uh, that would lead to a downstream migrating adjustment wave. If there's a change in a downstream control, let's say sea level rise, also related to climate change, that would lead to an upstream migrating adjustment wave. And usually, you typically you find waves, you know, different waves on top of each other. And this is a nice example where you see uh, the transient adjustment of the Elba River. Um, here you see water level profile, water level relative to 1888, so it's a pretty old data set, uh, as a function on the horizontal axis of river kilometer. Um, and you see a degradation wave migrating in the downstream direction. Um, if you look carefully, you might also want to see something migrating upstream from here, but I wouldn't dare see anything on that part. Uh, but this is another um, typical example of the transient response. Now let us go back to the case of river training. Um, we've done quite some river training in the past, um, in the Netherlands as well as Germany. And this image shows, for the Dutch part of the Rhine, the amount of floodplain area. So this color over here is the amount of floodplain area that was taken from the river. Um, and that's quite quite some area. So it's the amount of floodplain area taken since 1850. And besides the amount of floodplain area that we have removed, we've also installed, uh, installed the groins and so further narrow, narrow down the system. Now, what can we expect um, as a response to such river training? Trouble. All right, now let's look at this uh, simplified case. Um, so we narrow down a certain section of a river. Um, and what then is um, the response to such river training? Um, it's just a simplified manner of addressing the normalization works that we have imposed on the German and Dutch Rhine um, over the past few centuries. Uh, but how does the river respond initially and on the long term to such measures? Uh, 
And typically, the short-term response is very different from the long-term response. Now, here we start with the short-term response. So here we have a schematic um, up there of uh, a shortened or narrowed reach, I should say. Uh, B indicates the channel width. So over this limited stretch, uh, the channel width has been narrowed down. Um, if you then plot, this is short term, so only the flow adjusts. Um, the water discharge per unit width increases, right, over that narrow section. Um, the equilibrium flow depth uh, increases where the water discharge per unit width is, is larger. Um, we can also plot the equilibrium flow velocity by dividing the water discharge per unit width up there by the equilibrium flow depth. Of course, the water level profile will not follow these steps. It will create backwater curves, right? So it will form an M2 backwater um, over the narrow reach, and it will form an M1 backwater upstream from it. Um, and then if you divide the water discharge per unit width by the blue line, by the flow depth, you find the plot for the initial response of the flow velocity. And this is what you then find. You can repeat it, but we don't want to spend time. Um, so you see, clearly see uh, an increased flow velocity over the narrow section. This is what you would expect, but also an increase in downstream direction. If flow velocity increases in downstream direction, you know that the sediment transport rate will increase in downstream direction that, and that the bed will be great. Right? But here you see flow velocity decreasing, so the sediment transport capacity will decrease and sediment will deposit. So we foresee aggregation upstream from the narrow reach and aggregation in the narrow section. But what is important also to see is that over the narrow reach and upstream from it, the flow depth increases. Right, now the sediment transport rate per unit width has the same form. If we just assume a simple sediment transport relation, like the power uh, load, um, power law load relation, uh, it has the same shape as the flow velocity uh, profile. Uh, if we then plot this gradient, because we want to arrive at the extreme equation, we want to look at the initial aggregation and degradation along the river as a response to large scale narrowing. So we look at the spatial gradient of the sediment transport rate. So here you see the sediment transport rate, the spatial gradient going down. Uh, here is a sharp increase of the sediment transport rate. So here we plot the spatial gradient. And in order to arrive at the eta dt, so the initial change of bed elevation, um, we take the reverse of that. Um, and then we find that what we already anticipated that upstream we find aggregation in the narrow section degradation. Right? So this is how you arrive at the initial response to such a measure. You could do that for any measure. Um, but initially we see that flow depth increases in the narrow section and upstream from it. Alright, but if we now look at the equilibrium situation, it's almost opposite. Um, now here I just I just plotted, but we'll, we will be deriving um, the relations for uh, for this situation for the equilibrium state. But here you can see that in the in the new equilibrium state, for such a simplified case, it's super simplified. We'll see that, but it does help to understand the physics of of the response. In the new equilibrium state, flow depth here has decreased rather than increased, and you see degradation in the narrowed section, and even upstream from it. Well, we'll, we'll figure this out, why this is. Um, so let us derive some relations for the equilibrium state. All right, now it's not about the equations, um, but what is important to realize is that we conserve everything that needs to be conserved. Right, so sediment, uh, water mass, and stream-wise momentum. Uh, and to find the negative state, we set all the temporal derivatives equal to zero. Right? So we simplify 
Oh, we make some assumptions. We assume it's an alluvial channel, so no bedrock, large width to depth ratio. And so we can replace hydraulic, hydraulic, hydraulic radius by flow depth and a few more simplifications. And then we reduce them to an equilibrium state. So all temporal derivatives are set equal to zero. So most of the terms get erased. Um, and then we combine the remaining equations with a sediment transport relation. We can use any sediment transport relation. It's not important. Here we take, take a very simple one because it helps us to, to arrive at um, analytical solutions for slow uh, flow depth, whatever you like. Um, the equation that isn't the important one here for the stuff is the equation for the equilibrium slope, the lower one. So by reducing the, the conservation equation to the case of an equilibrium state and combining them with a the sediment transport relation, you find an equation for the equilibrium slope. And what we see now is that slope is S over here, Q is the sediment supply from upstream, the sediment flux. So the larger the sediment flux arriving from upstream, the larger the slope. So in order to be able to transport a larger sediment flux, you need a larger slope. The river needs a larger slope. That makes sense, right? Um, so the water discharge, if we just use a, 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 a representative value for the water discharge, QW works the other way around. So uh, the larger the flow rate, the larger the water discharge, the smaller the slope should be in order to transport the sediment downstream. Um, and here you see channel width, B. Um, so if we narrow down the system, which we have done over the past few centuries, if we narrow down the system, um, the, the equilibrium slope reduces. And this is the reason why our engineered rivers are so degradational. So we have reduced the equilibrium slope um, by narrowing down the system. And it's not because we reduce uh, the sediment flux coming from upstream, well, we may have done that too, but it's mainly a response to the normalization measures of the past. Um, and why, why does this happen? So if we reduce the channel width, the equilibrium flow velocity increases, and if the flow velocity increases, sediment transfer <coughs> capacity increases, um, but then the sediment transport capacity becomes larger than the sediment flux, so the slope goes down. So for a narrow channel, needs a, a, a smaller slope in order to transport the same sediment flux downstream. So it's a certain type of reasoning. So under what conditions is the river able to transport the sediment flux downstream? All right, now we can do this for, for any load relation, and we've done that. Um, so where did base level go? Uh, we addressed base level, um, but it sets, this is an equation for slope, and base level, sea level sets the downstream elevation absolute level of the profile at the downstream end. Now we then plot the equilibrium profile um, in a very schematized setting that looks like this, where slope is uh, set by that equation or something similar if you use a different load relation or if you take extra mechanisms into account. Um, uh, and some of you may know the lane balance. Some of you heard about it. No? Um, the lane balance. Um, a, a lane was a researcher and he published his lane balance in the 1950s. Um, I think it's from the area of geosciences. Um, and it's a relation, this is what Lane came up with in the 1950s, where slope scales with grain size over, the ratio of grain size over water discharge and the sediment supply rate over here. And you can see how similar it is to the relation that we found over there. Uh, and that's, I think, not a coincidence. Now, if we go back to that simple example of uh, our normalization case, so this would be the situation before narrowing, um, and if we now consider the narrowed section, um, we now understand that the narrowed section is associated with a smaller equilibrium slope, um, and that also holds for the water surface. Now, water surface over here 
And it makes even the upstream reach degrade because the base level for that upstream reach has lowered because of the degraded um, narrowed section. So it makes even the upstream part of the, of the narrowed section degrade. All right, so now we understand the slope adjustment of the Dutch system. Uh, we can extend um, this analysis to the case of mixed size sediment, which is one of my passions. Um, but before we do so, uh, it's important to introduce some terms. Um, particle abrasion. Particle abrasion occurs when particles hit each other when they get transported downstream or when transported particles hit particles at the bed surface. They, when they hit each other, they slightly lo they lose some mass and they become smaller when uh, getting transported downstream. Now, grain size selective transport um, is another term for saying um, mobility depends, depends on grain size. So usually the fines are more, more mobile than the coarse sediment um, and it makes the load, the transported sediment, finer than what you find at the bed surface. Um, and hiding, um, you may have heard uh, of hiding. Uh, when you have particles in the mixture at the bed surface, the fines tend to hide in the lee of coarse particles. And the coarse particles, they become more as exposed when you com compare to a situation with only coarse sediment. So the coarse particles become more mobile than in a case with only coarse sediment. And the fines, they become less mobile. Uh, than in the case with only that fine sediment. So hiding actually counteracts grain size solubility. It makes the, the mobility difference between fines and cores smaller. Um, all right. Now, we should also address profile concavity. Um, of course, you know that um, profiles are typically concave upward. And um, it has been argued by many people that, you know, and mostly engineers like me. <laughs> um, but if you just wait long enough, the profile will get uniform. Uh, and this is, of course, not the case. Um, so profiles are typically concave upward. And um, Morrison Williams, they have collected uh, a huge uh, data set, they've made a huge data set of natural data. Uh, also some leverage data, um, and what they did was um, they plotted, so they first fitted exponential uh, relations to uh, grain size, represented the grain size of the bed surface sediment, uh, over here, an uh, exponential uh, relation for the decreasing slope, and then they uh, looked at the exponent, here it's epsilon, and here it's alpha s, uh, they plotted them against each other, and you can clearly see that the two are very nicely correlated. Um, so the downstream finding coefficient, uh, it's called alpha, alpha s, is very nicely correlated um, with uh, the profile concavity coefficient. And this we understand because finer sediment is more mobile, and uh, finer sediment requires a smaller slope to be transported downstream. Right, it's, it's the equilibrium type of reason. Um, there's many other reasons for profile concavity. Um, profile concavity arises uh, due to tributaries, uh, abrasion and selective transport. We'll get to that. Uh, delta propagation, but here we focus on abrasion and, and selective transport. And um, Mackin was the first that uh, made a statement uh, on the relative importance of abrasion and grain size selective transport uh, regarding profile concavity and downstream finding. So what he argued was, he said that in a graded state, in an equilibrium state, it's particle abrasion that reduces grain size in downstream direction, and it's grain size selectivity and mobility differences that, that uh, make Finer sediment require a finer slope, a smaller slope to be transported downstream. Um, and, and this we understand, but then afterward, there were many researchers that said, well, this cannot be true because we see 
uh, such sharp decreases in slope and that surface uh, uh, grain size, um, such sharp decreases or I say large decrease over very short distances that can never be attributed to particle abrasion. And that's true. The difference between the two um, camps or groups is that one talks mapping and as well as they talk about the equilibrium state. And the second group or camp talks about the transient state. So both are both arguments are true. Um, but here we're talking about the equilibrium state, and in order to extend it uh, to mixed size sediment, uh, we need to add one conservation equation. So we now not only consider conservation of bed sediment mass, but we consider conservation of gravel mass and sand mass at the bed surface. The equations are not that important, uh, and um, furthermore, we consider water mass and streamwise momentum. Um, and we add terms that represent particle abrasion in a very simplified manner. And again, we reduce those equations to an equilibrium state. So most, most of the terms uh, get omitted. Uh, we again combine it with a sediment transport relation that now needs to account for grain size selectivity. So we have finer sediment is more mobile than, than coarse sediment. But we, for the sake of simplicity, we take a very simple power law load relation. Um, so we find analytical solutions to the slope, and now not only to slope, which is again very similar to what we saw before, but also for um, the bed surface sediment, bed surface grain size. So F over here, it's the volume fraction of gravel at the bed surface. The percentage of gravel that the river um, needs to have at the bed surface in order to be able to transport the sediment downstream. And if the bed surface sediment does not fulfill this, this equilibrium gravel percentage, then the river will work its way toward that grain size distribution. Well, um, this was seen before, and of course those relations simplify to the case of a single grain size if you fill, if you use only one grain size. Um, and if we now look at the results of those simplified relations, we can see that if we deal with abrasion, that our results, so the blue, blue up to yellow dots, fit very nicely uh, in the data set of Morris and Williams. So we can um, be happy about those results. All right. Um, now, up to now, um, do I get a sign when I'm running out of time? It's okay. It's okay. Okay. Um, so up to now, we dealt with engineered rivers, right? So we set, we imposed channel width. So we dealt with German and Dutch type rivers. Um, but what happens when we deal with natural rivers? Which of course we prefer, but um, then we have, a, we have an additional degree of freedom. It's also channel width that can change and that can adjust in order to allow the river to transport the sediment downstream. And we lack an equation, right? So we can either add a revision, but we're not too confident, you know, what you know what we should use. Um, so until we are more confident about what we should impose, um, I've decided to look at systems that can either adjust through adjusting slope, or systems that adjust primarily through changing their width and do not adjust slope. Um, now here you see how a river would respond to a change in some kind of representative discharge. So this is still a case with a constant discharge, but we take a representative discharge, and here you see that for a larger value of the water discharge, the flow rate, uh, the river, um, needs a smaller slope to transport the sediment downstream, the same sediment flux downstream. Um, this makes sense. Now, if we look at a system that only adjusts through channel width, through 
by guessing its general width and not by a guessing slope, for instance, because it's a large river where slope is set by the valley slope, and it takes a huge amount of time to adjust the slope, then you could maybe expect that the river will adjust through changing its channel width. You can see that if the flow rate would increase and the same sediment flux would be arriving from upstream, uh, the river will start adjusting its channel width. It will start to increase its channel width. If it doesn't do that, if it doesn't adjust its channel width, the sediment transport capacity would be would become too large, it would start to degrade, and it would not be an equilibrium state. So this is only showing the equilibrium state. All right, now people have used, this is an unsolved, this is an unsolved problem, right? We have, we lack an equation. We don't know how to close this set of equations. Uh, people have used various closure relations, um, but it's still an unsolved problem. Uh, but what we do see that if a channel responds to change by adjusting its channel width, it's very sensitive. Right? Channel width is very sensitive. All right. Um, and what maybe, well, the, these are just some, some hypotheses, but if, if you look back at this, um, this schematic of, of how a river adjusts to, uh, to change, um, I would guess that you know, if you would move from here, this type of adjustment, adjustment in, in this direction, I would say there's an increasing amount of sediment volume involved in the change. And the amount, if the amount of sediment that uh, needs to be either um, removed from the system or added from the system. If that increases, then I would also expect the, uh, the time scale of adjustment to increase. And maybe the type of change that requires the smallest amount of sediment, uh, sediment displacement, maybe it's the more likely type of change. So I would expect natural channels to uh, adjust through um, changing their width rather than slope. But their engineered systems cannot do that, so they are just changing their slope. All right, if I'm fine with time, uh, we can move uh, towards a, a variable flow rate. Um, because, of course, we know that we cannot represent the flow rate with one, one single value. Uh, but I should say that we've tried to do that. Now we've try to find values, um, representative values for the water discharge. And um, when we use representative values for the water discharge, we always need to be careful because we need to state clearly what we want the water discharge to be representative of. What should it reflect? Right? Um, People have, have uh, used bankful discharge as a representative value, effective discharge, discharge associated with certain recurrence interval, formative discharges for several features in systems, the slope equivalent discharge. Um, so this, so this is the approach that we are taking in in the remainder of this talk. Um, so the slope equivalent. Water discharge is the, that value of a constant discharge that for the given sediment flux arriving from upstream would end up in the same, end up with the same equilibrium slope as the full hydrograph. Um, it was first introduced by De Vries and later used by Doyle, Doyle and Shields. There's a half load discharge, general, general forming flood. So there are many values. Um, before we move on, we also need to distinguish between three typical segments if we're dealing with variable flow. So if we deal with a flood wave that is fairly um, well lengthened, so we're in the lower parts of the basin, right? So the flood wave has widened or, or lengthened, as you would like uh, to say, we can assume that the water discharge is more or less constant along the ridge. 
Although it varies with time, we can assume it's more or less constant along the ridge. So we, this is a, a safe assumption um, to make for the Dutch system. I'm not sure if in, in, in the German Rhine it has lengthened or not. Um, but if your reach is limited, you can you can make that assumption. But um, if you look at the downstream reach, this is clearly dominated um, by base level, right? By sea level. This is what we call the backwater segment. Then upstream from this point, we call that part the quasi-normal flow segment. So despite the temporal variation of the flow rate, the flow is more or less uniform. So it moves up and down with increasing and decreasing flow rate, but the flow is more or less uniform. And upstream from that is what we call the upstream boundary segment. People have called it the hydrograph boundary layer. Uh, there's various terms for that region, and this is the region where there's a mismatch between the temporal variation of the sediment supply and the temporal variation of the sediment transport rate that is associated with uh, the normal flow segment. But I will get back to that. It is. Uh, it has some relevance for um, also for flow um, plume experiments, numerical computations, uh, but it's also something that is physical and we see. Now, this is an animation, if it works, and it shows uh, the dynamics of the equilibrium state uh, in the three seconds. So it's mimicking the equilibrium state under conditions of a varying flow rate. Um, and what is important to see, so there's, the flow rate is varying, the sediment supply rate is also varying at the upstream end, and, um, the rate of change of the bed level has been multiplied by a factor of 25, otherwise you wouldn't see much. Um, so everything is distorted. Um, let's see if I get this going. Yes. It doesn't repeat. So with, with an increasing flow rate, you see that in the backwater segment, an M2 forms, and the sediment that is have built up in the backwater zone is washed out towards the sea. Let me show it one more time. So there's dynamics, not only the water surface profile, but also the bed level profile breeze with the flow rate. And the dynamics is larger in the backwater segment. Um, and these profiles you can also recognize, uh, or these segments you can also recognize in the field. And on the next slide, I will show a fairly old um, map of water level profile of the Benua Niger system. So it's this branch over here, the new Niger over here. And um, these are uh, old measurements of water level profile. It's a bit tricky to see. Uh, on the vertical axis, you see water surface elevation. And this is distance from the mouth. So this is the mouth, and you see three lines. So uh, three water level profiles at different discharges. Um, and uh, here you see the Niger. The Niger, and this is where the, the newer comes in at this point. Um, this is Lokocha, this is the uh, confluence between the new and, and Niger. And you see some other tributaries over there. Uh, but what is remarkable here um, is that you can see that only the downstream bit is backwater dominated, and upstream from it, it's more or less quasi normal. normal. So the normal flow equation may not be so bad after all. Right? And even those tributaries, you would expect some backwater effects upstream from them in the main, in the, in the trunk stream. Well, well they, they could be small and, and for that reason not create too much of a backwater effect. But um, the normal flow equation is not so bad in this case. Um, and those three segments are not just a uh, theoretical situation, um, but actually downstream, downstream from uh, a confluence over here, uh, you find a region where the sediment supply 
will typically have to adjust um, toward the sediment transport capacity in the downstream ridge. So you find such an upstream boundary segment, downstream from confluences, downstream from changes in width, uh, downstream from any change. And you find backwater segments upstream from any change, upstream from confluences, upstream from changes in width. So you find them, and it can also be the sum of the two, backwater effect and uh, um, the upstream boundary segment. And the normal flow segment is what remains. So where you don't feel the two effects, the other two effects. How am I doing that? Still good? OK. Um, now we can easily extend those relations that we just derived with a given state to the case of variable flow. And here you see uh, a flow duration curve. Uh, so it's probability density of, of the flow rate on the vertical axis and the flow rate on the horizontal axis. Um, uh, but we like things to keep things simple. Uh, and for the case of the derivation, we just use two, two flow rates, a base flow rate and a peak flow rate. Um, and later on, we can generalize it back to the full flow duration curve. Um, so this is just for the sake of the, of the derivation. Um, and the most important change here is that now the gravel flux uh, that should be transported in the equilibrium state, so this is the gravel flux coming from upstream, um, is partitioned between the base flow situation and the peak flow situation. So the gravel flux is the sum of the gravel flux during base flow multiplied by the time that the fraction of time the base flow occurs, and the gravel rate during peak flow multiplied by the fraction of time that peak flow occurs. All right, the same holds for sham. So this is the only additional, the only additional two relations that we need. Well, it's two if we use two. Uh, uh, two seven fractions, or three if we use three, uh, in this case two. So if you now use um, those relations for the mean gravel flux and sand flux, uh, we again use the mass conservation equations, simplify them to equilibrium conditions, we use the sediment transport relation that is suitable for mixtures, we use the normal flow equation, which means that our relation Relations are valid in the quasi normal flow segment. And um, we need to know what is the gravel input from upstream, the sand input from, from upstream, and we need to know the flow duration curve. And then we find similar, very similar expressions to the equilibrium slope um, and the bed surface gravel content, but they are applicable to the quasi normal flow segment. Um, in the meantime, one of my PhD students managed to figure this out also for the backwater segment, but I will not, um, will not present that here. Uh, but the interesting thing is also that the analysis provides us with uh, a representative discharge. Here it's called the dominant or channel forming discharge. Uh, and it's that value, that value for a constant discharge that will provide the same equilibrium slope as the full the full hydrograph would. So it's the value of a constant discharge that for the given sediment flux from upstream provides the same sediment, uh, the same equilibrium slope as the full hydrograph would. And we can extend the definition of that uh, representative discharge to the full uh, flow duration curve. So now we're back to the full flow duration curve rather than the bimodal flow rate. Um, and the analysis also provides us with information on how the gravel flux and sand flux, how they are distributed over the range of discharges. And this is what we tend to call the normal flow load distribution. So in a quasi normal flow segment, there is a certain distribution of the annual or the cable gravel and sand flux over the range of discharges. And this then also explains the existence of the upstream boundary segment. So this is the reach that the river needs, the, the, the length that the river needs for it to adjust the temporal variation of the gravel and sand flux 
to the temporal variation of the gravon flux that is associated with the normal flow time. So it takes a certain distance, a certain time, for the temporal variation of those fluxes to adjust. All right, now let us have a look at um, how a river adjusts to a change uh, in the variation of the flow rate um, if it would either respond to a change of slope and a, a, a change of uh, width. So here you can see that, uh, uh, here you see on the horizontal axis the standard deviation of the flow rate divided by the mean value of the flow rate. Um, and you can see that with increasing variability, so move to the right of the plot, the channel slope becomes slightly smaller. It's not too sensitive. With, but with increasing variability of the flow rate, um, the mean staying the same, um, a smaller channel slope suffices to transport the sediment flux downstream. This makes sense because of the nonlinear relation between uh, flow and the sediment transport. So the larger flow rates have a relatively large contribution to transporting the animal load downstream. Um, but if we now look at channels that adjust mainly through adjusting their width, uh, you can see that uh, with increasing variability of the flow rate, mean staying the same, the channel width responds very sharply to the increased variability. So channel width, channel width is very sensitive the variability of the flow rate. All right, now um, this brings me to the final topic, the quasi equilibrium state. Um, so before going there, uh, I think we need to state that this is also what this is what I took you tell my students. We have two species of rivers. We have groundwater rivers, sandbed rivers. Um, groundwater rivers is uh, gravel or coarser, and uh, sandbed rivers are of course dominated by sand. Uh, groundwater rivers are typically typically consist of bimodal sediment. Uh, sandbed rivers have a more unimodal uh, grain size distribution. Um, and the two reaches are dominated or associated with a decrease, a slow decrease of grain size and streamwise direction. But there is this sudden transition between the two reaches, between the two species. Um, and here you see the example for the Rhine, but it holds for most rivers worldwide, that there's this sudden transition. So you see the German part of the Rhine uh, and on the vertical axis, you see some representative grain size of the bed surface sediment. Um, you see a steady decrease of grain size, and then you get to this area that we call the gravel sand transition. And it's um, not just characterized by a sudden transition in um, the grain size of the bed surface sediment, but also by a sudden transition in slope. And uh, we understand that the two are correlated, right? The, the smaller sediment requires a smaller slope to be transported downstream. Mm -hmm. But what is causing what? You know, it's a chicken and egg problem. Right, now let's see if we can do something with, the, with our equilibrium type of analysis. Um, this was the first uh, example that, were, that was recognized in the field. It's the Kino River in Japan, um, and it was measured by um, Yatsu in 1955, and uh, here you can see that uh, the decrease of uh, grain size, a sudden step from gravel to sand, and again a slow decrease. And in the upper plot, you see bed elevation, and then in the inset, over here, you see that sudden transition in slope. Now, let's do a thought experiment. So now you can work a little bit. Um, so we consider a very, again, very simplified situation. So we neglect about more or less everything. Uh, we neglect abrasion, uplift, uh, subsidence, base level change, so no sea level rise whatsoever, no tributaries, no tides, no temporal variation of the flow rate. 
Uh, that's not much left. But we have a simplified breach in its equilibrium state in the cell gravel type river. So there's a certain flux coming from upstream, and the slope is its equilibrium slope. Right? So there's no reason for the bed to aggrade or degrade. The river is just fully capable of transporting the sediment flux downstream. All right. Now, what will happen, short term, long term, um, if the upstream sediment flux increases? What happens on the short term? Increase of slope. Where? What happens in the short term? So with the rise of the upstream end, in order for the increased flux to be transported downstream, the general needs a larger slope, right? It builds a larger slope to transport that sudden flux downstream. So it creates an aggradational wave that's, that migrates from upstream to downstream and builds to build a larger slope. So the new equilibrium state under conditions with no avulsions, uh, no change of width, um, as simple as this, uh, is characterized by a larger equilibrium slope. All right. Now, what will happen if we keep this? Sorry, if we keep the sediment flux constant, but we coarsen it, so the percentage of gravel in the upstream flux increases at the expense of sand. So the total flux is the same. It still needs a larger slope, right? So there will be an aggregational wave migrating downstream. And what else besides the aggregational wave? It will also be a slight portioning wave, right? Because if the river needs to be able to transport a, a coarser flux downstream, the bed surface will also coarsen a little bit. So the mobile arbor will, will get somewhat coarsened. Okay, so there's a coarsening and an aggregation wave migrating downstream, and it builds a larger slope to find a new equilibrium state. All right, now what next? Uh, but what happens if the flow transport gravel into a sand bed beach. So we start from an equilibrium state, there's only sand. It's more similar. It's just more, it's more extreme. It's more extreme. We know that for a coarser low, the equilibrium slope needs to be larger, right? So the new equilibrium state is governed by a larger slope. But now we have a gravel wedge, gravel wedge migrating downstream, and for the gravel to be trans transported downstream, it needs a big slope, right? So there's this gravel wedge migrating downstream, but there's there's some tiny nuance to it because for for the sand to be transported over the wedge there also needs to be some sand in the in the in the in the gravel wedge. So the wedge is also taking some sand to build the slope. So the sand flux arriving at the sand reach becomes reduced because the wedge needs some sand in order to transport the sand downstream. The sand flux gets reduced the sand flux to the sand that reach that reduces and the sand that slope reduces slightly. But the essence is the same. There's this double wedge migrating downstream until it reaches a new slope or uh, 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 and the gravel wedge has arrived at the downward boundary. And, and this you can also um, simulate with a simple numerical model. Um, it's based on the, uh, backwater equation and the Yerano equation, um, but we start from a sand bed ridge. Uh, the sand flux originally, 100%, the, the, the sand flux originally is 100% sand, this is an equilibrium state, and now we replace 30% of the sand flux by gravel at the expense of sand, so the sand flux is still the same at the upstream boundary. 
So we start from an active state, we add 30% gravel at the expense of sand. And you see this gravel wedge forming, migrating to the downstream end. This is a 300 kilometer reach. Everything seems to go very quickly. Uh, but don't be mistaken, this was a period of 30,000 years. Um, let's see if I can play it again. Uh, and if you looked very carefully, you can see the sand bed slope uh, reduce slightly uh, because the gravel wedge needs some sand in it. All right. Um, now we believe that that is the essence of uh, gravel sand transition, gravel sand transitions that we see in the field. We tend to think that they are stable and that they are located in one position. They, they can be stable. Um, we'll figure that out in a minute, but um, typically the time scale of migration is just so large that we tend to think they are stable. We just have data, it's a snapshot. We have data of the last um, few decades, but uh, it's a snapshot compared to the time scale of migration. All right, we built a very simple model, um, a cute model of uh, gravel sand transition uh, migration. Uh, based on mass conservation of sediment in the gravel wedge. Um, again, the equation is not so important, but um, here you see the, the migration speed of a gravel sand transition. Um, of course, it is uh, determined partly by the gravel flux at the upstream end of the reach. Um, here's channel width plays a role, the difference in slope plays a role in the migration rate. Um, but what is interesting here is that you see the base level rise, the rate of base level rise, so sea level rise, for instance, uh, delta progradation, um, and uh, the uplift rate, uh, which means that if you set this uh, migration rate to zero, you find a solution to the stable position of the gravel sand transition. And then you find that um, I should go here. If you set that uh, speed to zero, you find a solution to the conditions under which a gravel sand transition finds a stable position. And this happens um, if, uh, if the area subsides, because you create accumulation space for the gravel wedge, or if the delta prograts, or um, um, uh, if sea level rises. Under those conditions, uh, the gravel sand transition can find a stable pos uh, position, provided that that stable position is, is found within the domain. And sometimes it's not within the domain, and the gravel wedge can f run all the way until the sea. This is a, uh, an example in New Zealand, where rivers are fairly short, and the gravel wedge is migrated all the way uh, into the sea. All right, um, we validated those um, simple relations against the numerical, simple numerical model. They did very, uh, uh, the equations did uh, well. And we also, ah, before I compare it to field data, this is an example of how sea level rise holds the migration of uh, the gravel sand transition. So here it's the same case, so we start from a sand bed. Um, in an equilibrium state, we add gravel at the upstream end, 30% gravel at the expense of sand, and now impose a sea level uh, rise of, I think it's three, uh, three millimeters in a year. And you can now see that it finds a stable position. It takes a while. So it migrates slower and slower until it finds a stable position. And then if you would, if the sea level would start to rise faster, um, that would create retreat of the gravel sand transition. Because the stable, stable upstream, the stable position of the gravel sand transition is at a more upstream location for a higher rate of sea level rise. So if you would continue this run with a higher rate of sea level rise, the stable position would 
would retreat. So now the rate of sea level rise is increased from 3 to 7 millimeters, something like that, a year. All right. Um, we also compared those, uh, those simple models to field data. This is a case in Scotland. Um, it goes a bit too far to go into the details. Uh, and we also compared it to the Fraser River um, in Canada. Um, all right, that brings me to my conclusion. Um, so we have slightly adjusted the definition of Mackin and, and Gilbert, and now state that a river in its equilibrium state has not only adjusted its slope, but also its channel width um, and its surface texture, such that over a period of years it can transport the sediment flux downstream. Um, the controls are the average gravel and sand fluxes, or coarser, and the uh, flow duration curve. Um, it would also Im imply um, that estimates of the annual flux, annual, annual sediment fluxes, are very important to understand you know, what the river uh, moves toward. And we typically don't have that type of data. Um, at least it's very important to get a hold of. Um, it's a quantitative confirmation of the ideas by Mackin, Lane, Howard, and we have extended their analysis to mixed size sediment, variable flow, and to adjustment of the surface texture. It's also a quantitative confirmation of the ideas by Bowman and Miller. Um, it's important to realize that there's no single equilibrium state when planned from can adjust. Um, so this is still an unsolved problem. Uh, we find that channel width is very sensitive to flow rate, as well as variability of the flow rate. And uh, these relations, they can be uh, easily extended to uh, various basin related relations. Um, some conclusions on the gravel sand transition. It seems to be the result of a gravel wedge. Uh, it can hold under certain conditions provided that, it doesn't, that the stable position does not exceed the domain. Um, uh, GST retreat can occur, for instance, when sea level, the rate of sea level rise increases. Um, I didn't talk too much about this, but the large slope and gravel bed ridges make sand very mobile. I always tend to say happy and mobile. So we need you need a very small percentage of sand at the bed surface for it to be sufficient, sufficiently mobile to transport it downstream. So the fact that you hardly find it at the bed surface doesn't mean that it's not being transported, it's just very mobile, under a large slope over gravel bed bridge. All right, um, some remaining challenges. Um, the problem of the multiple equilibrium states has still not been solved. It's an intriguing, uh, very intriguing problem. It probably means that the stable equilibrium state that the river evolves toward depends on the initial state, or the state at a certain moment. Um, what about modeling the temporal change of channel width? This is also a, a difficult problem. Um, this exercise has not included plot planes. Uh, we have some ideas on how to do that, but it's, it's tricky because you need to say something about uh, elevation difference between the plot, plot plane difference, with, sorry, elevation difference between the plot planes and the main channel, or the sediment flux between the two. Uh, vegetation, channel pattern, um, and I'm also intrigued by the question, so how can this analysis be of help to better channels? I won't start it there. All right. Thank you very much.
Give me the language start. I'm sure. still not clear. What was, what, what, what was first, the chicken or the egg? So um, I'm wondering, you now showed the example of how would the slope change if you change the, the grain size distribution. Um, but on the other hand, isn't the slope something which is a kind of fact due to topography? And due to the topography and the, and the slope, the gravel of the grain size distribution comes naturally by itself. Because you say you don't know what is first. I would state, maybe you have a different uh, statement, but I would state slope is first because this is coming from the topography. Um, well, yeah, I was talking about the chicken and egg, the chicken egg problem with respect to the, the gravel sand transition. Um, I think it's just natural that you see that gravel well, that the sand two are transition. Correlated like grain size and slope, mm -hmm. that makes sense, for yeah. you, right? Sure. Um, but as soon as the soon as gravel is provided to a stream, to a reach, it starts building a large slope. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, yeah, the two go together. But I would say it's it's grain size first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, if you talk about grain size first, and this is then changing all the rest, all the other parameters like slope, and maybe there is something more which is adaptable. If so, if it's not a too engineered river, then also are there the other parameters. Wouldn't this be very, very important to take that more in consideration, for example, for the Rhine River when we do the state repeating? Because actually, I have the feeling there is a rough estimation of how the gravel, uh, sand, or whatever sediment uh, uh, mixture should look like or shell look like. But nobody really checked what does it mean if I change my mean grain size di diameter two or five millimeters up or down. Yeah, so one of the big questions for the Dutch Rhine is. What 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 arrives mm -hmm. from the German Rhine <laughs> to the Dutch Rhine? Yes. And um, so besides that story about the normalization effects and the narrowing and and, and the decrease of slope, uh, there's a second effect. I think it's it's a hypothesis. I cannot um, prove it in any way. Uh, a second effect where I think that flux is pushing. Um, and we see that the bad surface in the Niederrhein has coarsened significantly with time. Uh, and, and it can be due to several things. You know, the nourishments, uh, the artificial nourishments of sediment are coarser than what is present at the bed surface. Uh, there's degradation, maybe defined or washed out. The system is degrading into plants of sea sediment, uh, which is coarser, slightly coarser than the top layer. So there are several things that can create can be co the cause of the pushing, but if the bed surface in the Niederrhein is pushing, mm -hmm. it's likely that also the sediment flux that is arriving at the Dutch Rhine is also pushing mm -hmm. in the time. Mm -hmm. um, and if if that is true, it would uh, mean that uh, the equilibrium slope would increase, mm -hmm. uh, and it would be two counteracting effects. So we have a slope decrease going on as a response to the normalization measures of the past. And maybe an, an increase of the yeah. equilibrium slope, starting from your side, mm -hmm. um, from upstream, uh, that is migrating downstream. Mm -hmm. And maybe in, in, in a few hundred years, the Dutch Rhine mm -hmm. uh, is not quite a sandbed river anymore, but a gravel bridge. Mm -hmm. okay. So this is what I think. And we're currently doing some uh, bed surface grain size measurements. Mm -hmm. uh, we've neglected that for a long time. Um, um, but now we've started measuring again, and um, what I expect is that we see, we'll see some cushion. Mm -hmm. Okay, but this so means we should make an appointment for maybe in two or three hundred years' time to check again the new snow and the grand test distribution of the Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Any, other, any other questions? So, come, please. I have a question concerning the time scale. I guess after a strong flood, you get a huge change in all the sediments in the system. How long does it take to come back to this original equilibrium findings? Hundreds of years or thousands of years? After some flood? Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know if it would create uh, very large changes. Um, it would if, um, if a large amount of the substrate sediment is entrained, which is finer than the top layer. 
uh, then a lot of fine sediment would become available, uh, with, which would create shallows, um, and that would hinder navigation. So that would probably be uh, dredged away fairly quickly <laughs> because of the economic uh, consequences. Um, we've seen some breakup of armor layers in the ISO branch. This is the northern branch of the Dutch Rhine. Uh, but they tend to get, tend to restore, but the, the, the top layer tends to restore itself. Because if, if coarse sediment continues to be supplied from upstream, this mobile armor will form again. And, and uh, the erosion pit that may be created because of the flood may just be a temporary thing. Uh, but we are a little bit concerned with those types of changes, the breakup of armor layers. Any more questions? Yeah. yeah my, my question goes in a similar direction. Um, there has been sort of a trend to open up flood fields in case of larger flooding. And how would that actually affect the flux rate and the sedimentation rate and the, the coarseness of, of the, set, or the bedrock sedimentation interface? And you look at your diagram, because at the moment you have a very, let's say, uh, unilateral type of a of an approach model, um, how would that incorporate different fluxes from bloody fields that and, and meanders, etc. that we have nowadays? But do you mean that the temporary storage of yes uh, at, at peak flows? Yeah. Um, I I think the the effect of of those storage areas is is fairly limited um, if we're talking about more linear change. Because the major, um, for, of course, for, for flood safety, it's, it's, it's very important. And to manage them well, it's very important for flood safety. But for morphodynamic change, I don't think it's very important because the, the, the largest peak flows, um, they have such a short duration um, that their net effect on morphodynamic change is, is, is very limited. So it's, 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 the, it's more that the annual peak flows that type of flows that are more dominant dominant uh, regarding morphodynamics. Mm -hmm. So so it's it's the, the larger flows, but they also need to occur over a significant period in order to have some morphodynamic effect. Okay. So may I just add another question to that? <laughs> if, if you look at the current change in cycling of uh, of peak flows, and I would suspect that you have many more peaks occurring uh, rather than having one big long peak. So we have a lot of major events occurring sarcastically rather than one long one. How would that influence the flows? Um, do, do you mean the, the increased variability due to climate change, for instance? Um, and you would relate it to the Rhine River, or you would relate it to smaller rivers, or? So I, I, yeah, I would say that um, I would expect the flow rate definitely to be more variable in the future. Uh, and, and the rain fat component will be larger relative to the glacier uh, component. But um, an increased, increased variability does have some, some effect. Um, but I would say that, you know, if you consider the, the larger winter flows and, and milder summer flows, I'm not sure that the effect will be very significant on the short term compared to everything that is already going on in the system. The adjustment to measures that were imposed, I think, for, for a significant for a significant while, they will still dominate over the effects of climate change. With respect to droughts, the story is different. But those don't affect morphodynamics, don't affect morphodynamics too much. It's, it's safety, I would say. And, and I would wonder if these effects that then describe these short-term effects due to heavy rains, do really have or play such a big role in the lower rank, for example, because the catchment is that large. 
Mm -hmm. Then you can see these ex yeah. extreme flash uh, events or flash rain events. I don't think that you will see them directly. This is different maybe if you talk about smaller catchments and, and smaller sure. torrents, yeah. then you yeah. really see that. that sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question, I guess. Um, yeah. Only one more in terms of curiosity. I mean, how much data do you have to feed all your models with? Because this seems to be pretty impressive to me. I mean, making those long term statements. Um, yeah, it's so tight. <laughs> Which type of data you would yeah, need? Yeah. How much? Well, you would, you would more than just the, the morphological data, like the brain sexist distribution. For me, it was also or always times that the data is always the, the missing part. And I mean, I'm, I'm pretty impressed and also convinced by the results, but I'm just wondering how much data do you really have from the right to feed your models with? Um, well, I would say it, it, it's less data than, than less data than I expected. Because annual annual uh, sediment fluxes is way less data than, than how sediment, sediment transport rate varies with time during peak flows. Um, I still don't know how to arrive at those annual, measured annual fluxes. But flow duration curves, uh, that type of information we, we tend to have, at least based on the, you know, the last 100 years or so. Uh, and we can make assumptions on how that flow duration curve would change based on uh, climate change. So we could do, we've done those exercises where we impose, impose larger uh, winter flow rates and smaller summer flow rates and then look at the effect. Um, but the sediment flux is, the, is the, the painful part. That's me. Nice. Thanks, that was a great summary of your recent research. And you end up with this question about the multiple equilibrium states. And for me, it sounds like the question is rather how do we define equilibrium states? Because the factors they play into, we can vary them with a more damp or less damp, or with adding gravel or less gravel or yeah. with widening. So, in your opinion, in what direction should research and practice go um, to define that uh, equilibrium state that would be beneficial in terms of? Ecosystems and very often climate change. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, so I, I've seen some very nice research uh, being done in, in in the lab, where people start from different initial oh, states uh, and and look at what and, and, and uh, assess what equilibrium slope and channel width the system adjusts to. But those are of course very simplified cases. Mine too. No, my analysis is very simplified, but but it's part of the part of the puzzle, um, and I think it helps. And uh, Doug Jeremek, uh, Penn State, he has done some nice uh, research on equilibrium channel width, uh, and and we're now at the point where we want to combine this type of analysis with his type of analysis, which is based on mostly field data. Um, so I would go for several. I always prefer the field, field data, though um, yeah, that's the real thing. But it's, the, the problem is that it's the sum of everything there. Okay, any more questions? Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for this comprehensive overview. Um, I have a rather general question. Um, we showed the results of the application of different transport equations. And um, yeah, I know it's a difficult topic, uh, but I'm wondering um, if we can find um, other concepts for the future um, to better describe this process and to increase this broad variety of transport equations. Um, well, if I'm honest there, <laughs> I, I, I'm not brave enough to, uh, to go into seven transport relations. So what I prefer to do myself is to use multiple ones mm -hmm. and uh, and look at similarities between behavior. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think this is where you know where my strength is, um, and I I don't think I have the patience to and, and I don't trust myself sufficiently to uh, try and change a set of transport relations and, and find a better one. And I think there's a couple of thousands of sediment transportations and I don't think I 
can I have the one to the set that we have? But, but to, to complete that, I don't think that it's even necessary. No, because there are, it's not that uh, one equation is the good one or the best one, and other ones are worse. In the end, it's a question that you adapt it, so it means you make a good calibration, and that it anyhow displays the physical processes. Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned with, uh, I think it was Engel Hunton equation, to see what is the influence of width, of slope, and so on. Yeah. This is what the equation should reflect. And the rest is calibration, and it doesn't matter whether you use transport equation A, B, C, or D. Yeah, it's not really important. I tend to use four or five and then compare. Yes. Uh, yeah. and, and if they show similar trends, then I'm, yeah. then I'm like, yeah. I don't think yeah. they need any more equations. It's anyway, they are all more or less empirical equations. Oh. Yeah, you can add number, I don't know, x, y, z, uh, selection or collection of the equations, but it doesn't really make sense from my point of view. No, I mean, if you, I mean it, it is, of course, relevant if you're interested in a very specific reach and then you want yes. to study. Okay. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I want to provide more general, generic yeah. information. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other question? Yes, please. Uh, uh, thank you for your presentation. My concern is more about the water quality. Is there any correlation between the, the river morphology changes and the water quality and the biodiversity? Um, well, the short answer is yes, but I'm not the person that should respond this, to this question. There are studies that are concerning that. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not a specialized in an area though. Mm -hmm. No, but there's definitely people that can tell you a lot more. Any other questions or comments? Remarks? I was a bit wondering about one of your, the last uh, slides showing the change uh, of the morphology due to sea level rise. Oh. And I saw yeah. that, and I saw the scale, and it was really, whoa, this is, uh, okay, I also saw the time scale, which is something like 50,000 years or so, uh, but here, yes, I see an elevation 300 kilometers upstream of the delta, which is 600 or 700 uh, meters, so I mean, 300 kilometers uh, uh, upstream of the delta, and this is maybe roughly the border between uh, uh, the Netherlands and Germany, or maybe, yeah. Around. Well, this will not, not happen. Yes. <laughs> 600 meters higher. This is really a lot. I didn't really get what you considered as the sea level rise change, so the change in the sea level yeah, rise. It's order 3 to 5 millimeters a year, but. Um, okay, so then this would be 3 to 5 millimeters up to 100,000 years, it's something like 300 meters up uh, higher sea level. Okay, this is maybe and, and a theoretical uh, example. This would be a case where channel width yeah. remains constant okay. and there's no approach here whatsoever. Yeah. Okay. No formation of new channels. Okay. Okay. Super, 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 super right. right. Okay, yeah. I was a bit like, oh, 600 meters higher. This, this is a lot. <laughs> no, in, in, in reality, there will yeah. be different mechanisms yeah. okay. playing a role. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other question or comment? So, everybody satisfied by this very good presentation? And uh, thank you very much for all your questions and uh, your answers and the discussion. And, uh,